so that's why they're stuck in the school. We're, it's like the breakfast yeah, club. Yeah, I was going to say, we're, we're, <laughs> making, we're making breakfast club, I, too. That, that thought crossed my mind. Welcome to another backward compatible Halloween spooktacular. This week, Jim, Doc, and Chris put their delicious brains together to design an original scary game. Plus, impressions of Until Dawn, Lucifer, and Betrayal at the House on the Hill, Widow's Walk. The BackwardCompatible.com podcast starts right now. Compatible listeners, and welcome to episode number 82 of the Backward-Compatible.com podcast. Games and new media with a splash of academia. As always, I'm Chris, and I'm joined today by Jim. Hey, guys. And I'm joined by Doc. Boo, everybody. <laughs> and this is our Halloween Spooktacular. It's, uh, believe it or not, actually our third Halloween Spooktacular, so that's that's kind of fun. I can't believe I've known you guys that long. <laughs> yeah, it's scary, right? Uh-huh. Um, but today, our media topic of discussion is going to be, uh, we, we've talked in the past on Halloween about uh, scary games in general, but this time we're actually going to be coming up with a scary game of our own, kind of a design exercise, sort of like what we did for uh, so- Social Pariahism uh, a few episodes back, uh, we're going to be doing with uh, scary games. So what would we do if we were trying to design a a scary game or a horror game or what have you? But before we do that, we have some uh, delightfully spooky opening segments for you, including uh, the button mosh. Get ready for the button mosh, where the crew jumps in on the video games they've been rocking lately. So I've been looking for another game to play, and I I kind of stumbled upon this Halloween-themed game because I was in the mood. It came out a couple years ago called Until Dawn. It's a PS4 exclusive because it is published by Sony, but it's actually developed by Supermassive Games. Uh, You might know them from Little Big Planet. Oh, interesting. Yeah. So, Until Dawn is an interactive drama and, of course, survival horror game that its main mechanic is choice. You make choices that impact the narrative. And its its big focus is this concept of the butterfly effect, and they even explain it in-game early on in the first chapter. And um, the idea here is that decisions that you make that seem like they won't necessarily affect what happens uh, to the narrative in any sort of big way actually do. There's some sort of a ripple effect. Um, To give an example, early on, I had the opportunity to, I'm at at sort of like a a makeshift shooting range, and I I could have had one of my characters shoot a squirrel. I chose not to, but I could have done it. And I got some sort of, like, message on screen saying that, like... Uh, the squirrel will remember that? No. <laughs> it's not telltale. It says something like nature remains in balance or something weird. Hmm. Um, but uh, you, You've not disrupted the ecosystem. Yeah. I don't know what would have happened. But apparently, something probably not good would have happened had I decided to shoot that squirrel. And I almost did, by the way. I thought it might be funny. And the let trees me, would have come after you? And let me explain why I thought it would be funny. Because I want to put this game into context. Mm. This game takes a... a the tone of a cheesy horror film in the vein of, like, 80s, 90s, early 2000s horror movies. So it's a bunch of teenagers in a cabin. There's some sort of supernatural stuff going on, and there is a maniac killer or possibly maniac killers. Oh, you know what? Now they're, now they're mentioning this. I think I might remember seeing a little bit about this. I haven't played it, yeah. but, yeah. So it's... it's you're in you're in this cabin. It's it's during the winter, so there's a lot of like snow. It's very dark and cl- and cloudy, gloomy atmosphere. Oh. And um, essentially, the the initial chapter, the prologue chapter, which I assume you can't you can't save either character. But um, in this game, you control all eight teenagers. There's two additional ones in the first pro- in the prologue. That's the true horror right there. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. You're always controlling <laughs> these, these crazy teenagers. Um, but you control them in different different parts of the story, and you not you don't get to pick between who you control. It just it depends on whatever the narrative, however, directs it, and also which one which ones are still alive. Mm-hmm. I should say. So in the first part, you control two of them specifically, and at least in my version, neither of them survived. Now I don't know if they can survive, but my assumption is they can't, just because the entire narrative of the story is you are the same group of friends returning to the same cabin. 
um, after a year later, after these two had gone missing in the woods, and that you don't even know that they like no one knows that they died, but of course you do because you were controlling both characters. Should have killed the now, squirrel. Well, that, that happens later, actually. Ah. So maybe there was a way for me to save them, and they just disappear. I don't know. I'll have to figure that out on a, on a second playthrough. But um, the idea here is that, at least in my experience, um, there's a bunch of weird supernatural stuff going on. Like, potentially that the cabin might be haunted. But also, there's clearly a maniac. Because I saw a maniac before when in the prologue. And I'm starting to see a maniac now. But I don't know to what extent how far this person will go. Um, And I also don't know if he is actually supernatural or if they're just messing with you. Mm -hmm. But it does a really good job of having this tone of a cheesy um, horror film. So it kind of reminds me, you know, kind of like Scream or something. Sort of has that kind of tone where it's definitely horror. There's some moments that are actually kind of spooky, kind of scary. Um, But also it it keeps it light enough that you're entertained just by some of the weird things the kids say. Mm -hmm. So, um, for example... You can get into like a snow, like you get in a snowball fight as as one of the people like you know as this girl and her boyfriend and you're in this snowball fight and you are throwing you like you have to you aim the snowballs you can either hit him or not hit him you can actually fail if you if you incorrectly hit him with a snowball or you can intentionally not throw a snowball or you can throw snowballs at like birds and like knock a bird nest out of a tree or like hit a bird. I didn't do not that. Knock nature out of balance, man. Maybe yeah. maybe that's what that was. See, I don't know though. <laughs> and so there's these little these little those are minor choices, mm-hmm. but there's also major choices in this game that I think make it very interesting. It doesn't feel like it's much like the Telltale games, and I'll tell you why in a few reasons. One, production value. Um, they spent a lot of work on face, facial motion capture, hmm. and each hmm. character is an actual actor. You, Probably will recognize most of them if you play, or many of them if you play. Um, Hayden Penetieri plays one of the main characters, one of the teenagers. She's probably the biggest name in terms of the teenagers, but all of them seem pretty familiar. I'd probably have to look them up to know where I saw them from. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's actually well done. Uh, the acting fits the, the tone. Anytime the acting feels a little bit off, you can sort of excuse it because of just general cheesiness and mm-hmm. the fact that they're teenagers. There's a lot of uh, plain or like every character has a stat, so or like multiple stats. So, but it's not things like strength or speed or you know typical RPG stats. Instead, it's personality traits. So it's like honesty, bravery, um, charitability, romance. You know, so it's little things like that. And then they also have their in, their relationships with all the other teenagers. And so as as you play the game, you in, you change these stats based on the, your choices that you make. And you change your relationship to the other characters. That's really cool. So as I'm going through the game, I'm finding... Of course, people react differently to you based on this. Mm-hmm. Um, I've already already have a couple of the characters that pretty much at each other's throats, of course. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm definitely stowing a couple of... Po- or, or However that term goes. I'm definitely uh, um, causing some mischief, mm-hmm. I should say. But um, And I certainly have some characters that I, I like a little bit more than others. But there's also this other element of... When you're playing one of these characters, even if you don't necessarily like the character, you still don't want them to die. So, uh, or, or if you're chasing after someone to like help them out or save them or something, you also don't want them to die. So I've been trying to not get anyone killed, at least after the prologue. And I failed so far. The rumor is you can save everyone. Well, um, I did have one of the teenagers get sawed in half. Minor spoiler. I, and um, I may have been the one that did the sign. <laughs> Uh-huh. You, you personally, you just you dove down into the game and you did the song? No, I meant the character that I was controlling. Oh, I see. Essentially, <laughs> the game has, has got to the point where um, the maniac is quite crazy. And he's sort of doing this, like, I guess it's like a saw-type mechanic. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. Even though there's a saw, but also saw in the sense of you're giving this, like, impossible choice. And it's mm-hmm. like, you can only save one of them. You get to pick mm-hmm. who you want to save. You, you would like to play a game? Yeah, that sort of situation, and so that's already starting to happen. Mm. And so, I, in a way, I did directly contribute to someone's death. Um, maybe there was a way to not make a choice. I don't know. Mm. Maybe it was a bluff, but I did. I, I chose to make a choice. Mm. I, I chose to make a choice because they, they even say in the game they make it very clear early on that sometimes the the quote best option is to not do anything. Mm. Like sometimes you don't even have to make a choice. 
I, I will say it's it's certainly a game that um, I will recommend y'all play. Actually, I'm really point. I'm really interested. I want to check it out. It's yeah. pretty cool, and and it's it's at a discount price now. One of the biggest complaints people had, from what I saw, was it's only a seven hour game, but you're meant to play it through multiple times, and really, it's presenting you know a story to you. So I think it kind of works. It's only twenty dollars now, though, so it's wow. not a sixty dollar game. That's so great. I think at twenty bucks. Yeah, pick it up. It's it's a bargain, I think. Yeah, nice. Believe it or not, we're not always playing games. Every now and then, we like to talk about the other stuff. I recently have gotten into a show. Uh, I, I just bought it on Prime. Uh, season one is in the can. Season two is uh, being aired right now. Like four or five seasons and uh, episodes into into season two. It's called Lucifer. Now, as I understand it, this is actually based off of a uh, DC property. Hmm. Yes, but, it is. Um, what, it's it's not really a superhero story because I'm, I'm not a huge fan of superhero stories. I don't think I'd like that. Um, it actually is about the devil. It's by uh, the comic series was by Mike Carey. Okay. Um, and it was originally a spinoff of Sandman by Neil Gaiman. Oh, okay. Which I'm sure you've heard of. Yeah, sure. Sandman. Absolutely. And it's basically the character of Lucifer appears in Sandman. Mm-hmm. And then the, sp- the spinoff that Mike Carey uh, wrote, the Lucifer series, is all about Lucifer. And what happens to him after that. Oh, okay, yeah. interesting. Well, um, what I like about this show is that, especially as someone who studies uh, cultural apologetics, it, it, it's not very theologically accurate, but uh, it is a sort of a what-if kind of scenario. And I like shows that are what-if scenarios, mm-hmm. uh, especially ones that are about uh, topics that interest me, uh, such as, uh, you know, is the devil really such a bad guy? And the whole idea behind it is that, um, mm. that basically he was the Lord of hell. He got tired of his job. And so he decided to go on vacation or <laughs> retirement, depending on how you look at it. He's been on earth for about five years. Um, dad, who he this is what he calls God, um, has said, okay, um, time for you to come back to the underworld now. And he says, no, not going to do that. He has influence over people in that he can um, make them tell what their greatest desire is. But he can't make them do stuff. He doesn't have have, uh, psychic powers or anything like that. This is like established really early in the the first episode. He he says, I'm not a Jedi. Um, (laughs) Which is funny. Uh, So what Basically, his job is is to um, to punish people, which is a little you know, okay, whatever. Uh, but he also is kind of the judge in hell, hmm. you know, which is also sort of interesting. Um, Got to wonder who's who's judging to see that they get to hell in the first place, and he's I guess doling out the punishments. Uh, that would be Jesus, by the way. But uh, it, it's one of those things where uh, he decides that he is going to um, just have some fun. And then he hooks up with this detective. And it's uh, former, she's, she's a former teenage star, went and became a detective, so you've got the hot detective thing going. Is it Hayden Panettiere that I was mentioning before? Uh, no. No. Oh. And... Uh, Seem more interested in this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and Lucifer is... Uh, she's older than a teenager at this point. Actually. Well, Sorry. yeah, yeah. Uh, but, but Lucifer's like really... Uh, Intrigued because his power does not work on her for whatever reason. And so the story is largely about um, why does this, why does my influence not work on her? But at the same time, he's discovering that he is changing. And so he is no longer the angelic being that he was. He's becoming mortal. Mm. And so um, by the end of the first season, you get this really great story arc where he's figured some of it out. He hasn't figured some of, uh, you know, some of the other things out. But really what it comes down to is you've got the devil in L.A. helping to solve uh, LAPD uh, murder mysteries. <laughs> and it's just this great, silly little show. Huh. The, and, the, and the characters are fantastic. They're amazing. So well acted, well written. Uh, give it a try. Hmm. Yeah, I might have to go back and, and give it one more try because I I think it fell into the pilot trap where the pilot tries to throw everything at you all at once. It does explain a lot. And I I, I just at a certain point I like I mean I still watched it but mm-hmm. I shut it off in terms of mental. I was just like I I'm not even right. paying attention anymore well, because it what was just I like, so much. What I like is over and the I've course of the comic series too. Yeah. I was like <laughs> I was like what's going on here guys? You're throwing way too much at me here. And over the course of the the first couple of episodes you realize this guy he's still the devil. 
Um, yeah, he's he's not a moral guy, you know. He he's he's drinking, he's debauching, he's doing all of these things. Uh, even though he seems to kind of have a crush on the on the detective or whatever. Um, ba- basically, he's just like he's a sinful dude, and he embraces that. But whether but is he an evil dude? And that's that's the, kind of the question. That's the whole yeah. point of the show. Is he's like all the evil of the world gets blamed on me. I'm not a bad guy. And, and this really just kind of like, hmm. oh, well, well, okay. <laughs> uh, but yeah, Lucifer is the name of the show. Give it a whirl. Sounds like a devilishly good time. Ah. Now it's time for Table Talk. Discussions on tabletop games of all kinds. All right, well, we have talked about expansions in games before, but there has not been an expansion quite like this one. Betrayal at House on the Hill. It's a game that is over a decade old, mm. and it has finally, finally come out with an expansion called Widow's Walk. Now, on a fundamental level, there's really not much more to Widow's Walk that's not already in the base game. But if you understand how the game works, it works based on scenarios. A game that's been out for 10 years, if it's got you know 20 or 30 scenarios in it, you've played them all. And that's the problem. Now, 50 brand new scenarios, uh, 20 or so new tiles that go into the room, including uh, what's called the roof. It's a new floor. Uh, I don't know why they didn't call it the attic, but they called it the roof. Um, And also uh, new new, new cards, new uh, items, new um, haunts, that sort of thing. But... Uh, no new characters, and so some people were surprised about that. But that hasn't surprised me too much. Uh, I think the the characters that were in there were sort of modeled based on um, a good cross section. If you were to bring new stuff in, people might be tempted to actually uh, play more players than the game can handle. Mm. And so um, I, I think that that was probably a good decision. I played it twice through so far. Um, you of course add it to all the material that's before. There's some really great little changes um, but most of them uh, it's the same more of the same what I found really interesting though was the description by the creator um, that came in the box itself and he was talking about how uh, he had been with Wizards originally and, and developed it and done all these things, Wizards of the Coast that is uh, done all these things originally and then kind of left the company, walked away and that's the reason why there was never a sequel uh, now there are a lot of really big names on that team Rab Davio of uh, the uh, like, like Legacy series was on that team you know, the Legacy what is it? Le- Legacy Pandemic Season 2 has just been announced, uh, Sea Falls on its way out that kind of thing but um, what uh, what's interesting about it is because they called him up and said, "Hey, are you willing to do this expansion?" He said, "Sure," um, and basically handpicked his team, and so he got some really well known writers to um, to write for this. And so you look at it, you're like, "Oh, short story horror author so and so did this and did that." Now, I'm not going to spoil any of that, but uh, what what's neat about it is. Just on opening the box, to give you a kind of a hint here, uh, I found a card called Boomstick. I found a card called um, Hand Possession. I found a card uh, that talks about uh, the items of the cabin going crazy. And there's a whole scenario which plays into that stuff. Um, whenever your hand goes crazy, you have options. One of them is to cut them off and replace, the, replace them with the next item in the deck. <laughs> also, ha- that Very has cool. been added is a chainsaw. So, I- if you know the reference there, you're, you're going to jump up and down. You're going to be like, "That is the most amazing thing ever." Evil Dead Two. Um, so, they they know their audience. They know who it's for. It's for Jim and me. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I've seen Evil Dead. That and sounds pretty awesome. Yeah, right, it, yeah, it is. But yeah. at the same time, you know, a lot of people are going to be like, "What? I don't know." Well, they did the reboot not too long ago. See, so, mm. yeah. um, but it really uh, don't watch the reboot. No, I know. <laughs> watch the series on Stars. Right, the series is great. Mm. Um, but all of that is to say that uh, Betrayal House on the Hill has has needed, wanted, been begging for an, uh, kind of an upgrade or a refresh. And now that we have one, it opens the door for others. I am so excited, so happy 
that that has finally happened. And I got to say, the two games that I played, super success. Very, very deep and rich story. Um, one of them took about an hour and a half. The other one took over four hours to play. Oh, wow. So, yep. And I was the traitor. And, <laughs> and they, they beat me down. Of course you were. That was very sad. <laughs> Well, if you had a chainsaw for a hand, I think you might have fared a little bit better. But. Well, that's just possible. But no, they stole my thoughts. Um, I was the space professor, and I was going to return to the cosmos. Um, but they, they whittled me down and, 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 and mind-raped me. It was awful. Yeah, well, yeah. that sounds um, lovely. Yeah, I had brain straws, too. I did. <laughs> but not enough. Overall, it just sucked. <laughs> This week's meaty topic of discussion. So, meaty topic. Uh, we are going to conceptualize a scary slash horror slash whatever game in the spirit of Halloween. Well, maybe not necessarily. The game itself won't necessarily be in the spirit of Halloween, but in the spirit of Halloween, we are doing this. You're talking about the 80s movies for Halloween? Um, no. <laughs> no. Mike Myers? No. 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 Of which the original is actually a really good movie. Yeah, it is. Really great horror yeah. movie. Still one of the best horror movies, but the sequels, not so much. Well, that was my very rude transition to this question. Yeah. Should we be thinking of them as movies? Should we be thinking of them as horror series? Right. Or should we be thinking of them as something else? Yeah, and I, and I was thinking along the same lines, too. When, when you think of something like horror... Um, you mentioned Evil Dead too, and, yeah. and the series on on Stars right now, Ash versus Evil Dead, which is very much a comedy. Yes, yes, it, but it's a horror comedy. Yes, it is, um, and it, it delights in gore, mm-hmm. and that's something that even you know st- quote strict horror movies also have done. If you go back to the eighties, um, the Nightmare on Elm Street series, of course, they got more and more comedic over the years, oh, yeah. and then tried to return you know reboot to the old style, and then went back to comedy. But mm-hmm. even the ones that were that played it straight, like the original Nightmare on Elm Street, mm-hmm. arguably the sequel, and then also um, A New Nightmare, they still had plenty of gore. Oh, and the, much, and the yeah. front of the 13th series, those were all, in a manner of speaking, different levels. Campy, because you had the whole teenager aspect, teenagers in a cabin, or, or what have you, on a lake. Um, getting killed by Jason, but so there's a little bit literally campy. Yes, um, and so sure there was a, there was an element of cheesiness to those films, but at the same time there was still genuine horror, genuine scares, and lots of gore. So the relationship here, you know, just how far do you, do you take it? Like until dawn that I mentioned before, it's actually plays itself. There's cheesiness, but there's also a lot of real horror elements intentionally, mm-hmm. and it does play it straight. It doesn't play it like a joke. The cheesiness is just because they're teenagers, and the way they interact with people sometimes is, well, it's, it's sophomoric, mm-hmm. you know? And, and even, even in the face of situations that might be more serious, they act in a way that maybe you would only act if you're in a movie just because that's the way they're telling the story. Mm-hmm. So there's that element of it too, but there's still gore. Yeah. So one thing that I think we should kind of establish is if we're talking about developing a scary game a horror game mm-hmm. so it's a horror game so wh- where what what is our take on on this genre is it this is going to be a play it straight mm-hmm. completely serious horror film like, i would say i would, mean, I would or, expand on this question maybe this is something where we decide the tone first and then talk a little bit about this but i think theme is also important sure um is this kind of something that's trying to teach like a moral lesson perhaps or is it something that's kind of like a commentary human nature or is it just like Gore for gore's sake, horror for horror's sake. Right. Or, and, or is it satirical? Is it a comedy? Right. And a lot of these films, too, I mean, the ones that, you know, truly great horror films, a lot of times they are trying to. They have, I, I don't know if mess, uh, message is the right word. Certainly they're not teaching you they have a moral. some sort of moral thing. I, I wouldn't really the, call they it can, a moral You can thing. kind of call them psychological in a way. Yeah. And sometimes what ends up happening is it's like... Sometimes the the theme or the message is that, like, you know, we can talk about morality. We can talk about, like, making the right decisions in different Mm -hmm. cases. But sometimes there's just, like, random violence that we're not going to understand, and that's scary. Or a lot of times these movies and stuff like that are about the lack of control. Um, And it's a commentary about how we as humans don't like to not be in control. And that's why these situations are scary. Right. But even in something like um, Night of the Living Dead, Mm -hmm. one of the most well-known horror films, early zombie film, um, a big part of that movie was the social commentary on race relations. Mm-hmm. Yes, it was a major theme of the film, mm-hmm. and it, it it becomes it presents it almost as though it's ridiculous that it still exists when 
there are these literal like undead creatures mm-hmm. coming after them you know in the area mm-hmm. and yet there's still that concern about race yeah. going on so so or on a similar note like the walking dead right. the walking dead refers to the people and not the zombies um it's yeah. it's the show is about Really, the real monsters are the living. The living are the ones that you have to watch out for, mm-hmm. not the. I mean, you have to watch out for the zombies, but you know, and, after a while, it just becomes part of your environment. It's the people that will kill you. Right, right. I mean, but also there's plenty of other like uh, the birds, for example, mm-hmm. was was example. kind of a commentary on you know nature mm-hmm. come, spinning out of control and our relationship with nature and how much. Do we have we contributed to that? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Birdemic is about global warming. Well, let's yeah, let's, <laughs> that's clearly not a real film. It's a joke. The obviously. birds was not about environmentalism. <laughs> just, just state that right yeah. now. Yeah. Uh, but uh, yeah, I mean, the, so, so we could include that. I think it's more important to, to look at if we're talking about theme. Um, are we talking about? To me, it's like okay. When it comes to horror, are we talking about a natural a supernatural horror are we talking about a natural horror like say like in the birds it's a natural horror or are we talking about a supernatural horror like say a ghost mm-hmm. or are we talking about a monster which mm-hmm. i think is something slightly different or from something demonic yeah, supernatural something, right because yeah. yeah, it's, it's a, one thing it's to a go a physical out creature the, go out into the woods your car stalls right. and and you uh you try to get help from these people and you turn learn you know learn that they collect human skin and see that would be slightly different from monster too. See, I would say oh, that's yeah, human. So there's also the man versus man element right. of it, where you know they might be maniacs. Clearly, they're maniacs if they're like skinning people, but they're also human maniacs. Whereas, right. say, um, you know, Freddy Krueger is not a human maniac. He attacks you in in your dreams. Right. So he's a monster. He's supernatural. Yeah. Right. Or like, um, you know, the creature from the Black Lagoon. That's a monster. Right. You know, it's not. It's it's where. And then there's also like the supernatural elements of you know like. Um, Poltergeist, mm-hmm. for example, um, it's it's ghosts. It's these creatures like you can't you can't physically touch them, but they will kill you. Yeah. So see, I personally think that a show like uh, CSI Spec- Special Victims Unit is like the creepiest thing on television. <laughs> I, I really thought you were going to say Spectral Victims Unit. No, no, not say, Spectral Vision. <laughs> why didn't I know this existed? I was I was going to get so excited. <laughs> no, I, I mean, it's it, it it's a very specific, very niche kind of. Um, we're going to tell uh, stories about uh, creepy perverts, right? That's what that show is about, and that's very real. Mm-hmm. Sure, you know that, sure. that that's that's like I. That might happen. So, to me, um, the idea of that is is more real and, and, and but maybe not quite as scary mm-hmm. as something that's slightly less real but still possible, like uh, Maniacs in the Woods. Yeah, right? that's why I think Halloween was so scary because it doesn't take place. It's not Maniacs in a Woods. Yeah, it's, it's like a, one killer. It's a guy. It's one killer in one community in one space. He's a real person. Mm-hmm. It's one of the things that makes it so scary. Something like Jack the Ripper, I think, sure. um, is is great. Uh, you know, so when when I'm thinking about what scares me, and I, it's a very personal thing. Fear is a very personal thing. Right. Yeah. You know, um, spiders uh, creep the heck out of me, but whenever there's one in my living room, dude, I can kill it. I'm not I'm not afraid of a spider. I, I hate them. Well, if it was forty foot tall, you might be afraid. And that's of it. the thing. <laughs> it's, uh, yeah. or, or you try to swat the spider, and somehow it doesn't die. Yeah, and then it lunges on your oh, face. Oh no, that's happened. <laughs> Maybe not the face. Uh, no, I, I mean I'm loading laundry into the into the the machine, and uh, the spider crawls out of the laundry and up my hand, and he's like an inch, and I'm I scream like a little girl <laughs> because uh, this thing, it's terrifying. Now, uh, you know, I shake it off and then go get a shoe. And took care of it and ended it, uh, so man won. But it still <laughs> scared me. It was it was the literal spider jump scare crawling up my arm. Uh, so you know, what was that one commercial where like the the girlfriend's freaking out? There's a spider and says to kill it. So the guy goes over. He's like, oh whatever. He tries to like poke it with its finger, but the spider grabs the finger and then like just tosses the guy around the room. <laughs> nice. I, I forget what that was an ad for, but it was humorous. Oh, we'll see. It wasn't a very good ad then, was yeah. it? <laughs> but, uh, so, yeah, I think I think there's something for, for a vote for nature um, over here, a vote for man uh, mm. over here. But when it comes to monsters and stuff, um, really, unless it's a fantasy thing, I, I, don't, I don't usually get scared by monster horror or games. Well, and that's where, when we talk about um, the fear factor, it, are we trying to scare them or is it horror? Because right. I, I think that there's... 
maybe a misconception or maybe it's just what the genre has become, but horror doesn't necessarily mean that you're afraid of it per se. I mean, it means that it has elements that could potentially frighten someone. Mm -hmm. But um, like you said, monsters, I mean, you might be afraid of something like Freddy Krueger attacking you in your dreams, maybe, Mm -hmm. but that's not very realistic. And so that's, I think, why a lot of those movies, when they started to go into the sequels, became more comical. But if you, have, if you have something like, say, um, and it's, I, think it's, I think it's very based on the culture that you're in. Because, for example, in the 19, in, in, let's say the 19, like, 30s or something with, say, vampire films. You know, we're all the rage and vampires. Mm-hmm. People mm-hmm. were afraid of vampires because it's this, this kind of, like, foreign element, unknown. You didn't really know um, what sort of people might live in this area and, like, this remote area. So maybe because of just the knowledge that people have science and all that maybe is, is lacking, they might think, well, maybe something like this is possible on some level. You know, it's like a blood drinker. It's this person that, that seems to be um, immortal and have some sort of, like, power over you. And yeah, power that's a really good people. point. And then you go into the 50s and you have um, aliens and people start, you know, thinking that they see beings from other planets. Mm-hmm. And you have this fear of, well, okay, oh, well, aliens aren't real. You shouldn't be scared of them. But wait, are they real? And so there's that element of maybe they are scary. And if you look at something, of course, later on after the 50s, um, one of, I think, the best horror movies, Alien. It's, yeah, it's, I agree. It, and it's a fantastic horror movie. And we know that particular alien doesn't exist. But that movie's still terrifying. Mm-hmm. I, th- I think there's... A, and a lot of it is yeah. the element of the unknown is kind of what I'm mm-hmm. getting at. Is that we don't know... Like, if, if you can create the fear in such a way that you don't know what it is, mm-hmm. and you're not sure, that's... That tends to scare people more mm-hmm. yeah. than, okay, it's we know it's this maniac with a knife, or um, we know it's this like you know a bunch of spiders have grown out, grown out of control and they're trying to kill us. That could be a joke movie. Like Arachnophobia was mm-hmm. mostly a joke for yeah, that reason yeah. because it's like, well, it's a bunch of spiders trying to kill you. But what if it's like people are dying and they have these weird welts and you're not sure what's doing it and something's happening and you're trying to figure it out for most of the movie and like things. That's a lot more terrifying because whatever you build in your head becomes mm-hmm. so much scarier. And mm-hmm. so if, if we do something along those lines, mm-hmm. like, say, an alien where you don't really see the alien until super late in the movie and you don't really even get that good of a shot at it, mm-hmm. really, until, like, almost the very, until the very, very end, pretty much. That's what makes that movie so mm-hmm. scary. I think part of it, too, um, what tends to make the difference between, like, even if we have these sort of things, it's like, okay, X isn't real, Um but the trick is to kind of if the if the movie's doing its job right or whatever it is, it might not be a movie necessarily, but it's doing its job right. It's going to get past that that disbelief. It's gonna you're gonna be able to spin disbelief because it's gonna make it very real to you through the characters. Right. If the characters actually become like no like you can feel like the characters afraid of these things because you've you've started to accept this reality in which there are these aliens or there are there are these monsters or whatever the case might be. Mm-hmm. Then I think we're able to have more flexibility in what it is that is the the horrific threat. And so there's kind of like you were saying, Doc, the everyday sort of like, here are things that actually could happen that are really scary. Mm-hmm. And that's definitely valid for horror. I think that definitely like is a good thing for the genre. But then we have a lot of things like, say, Nightmare on Elm Street, where I've never seen it. But I would imagine that if they are doing a good job, you are feeling at least for the characters, if not like the characters, that like they don't want to go to sleep because they don't want to die in their dreams. That's real to them. Right. It's a fear right. of falling asleep and that's gonna like drive you insane. And that's the benefit of that we have, you know, in, in video games yeah. over films, mm-hmm. is that we don't want our character to die. Mm-hmm. Right. Or we don't want our characters, if there's multiple characters, like in Until Dawn, to die. So there's that added element of, well maybe it's not real real, but you know, to you, but to your character, it's real. And as you're playing that game, you don't want to die. Mm-hmm. You don't want this thing to get you, or or, or what have you. Willing suspension of disbelief. Sure. And, and that's what agencies feel sure, a lot of. Sure. So. But, I, but we have a little easier time, I think, in games yeah, than we do in film. Because you can, you can affect the player in certain ways mechanically that you can't affect them through just their observation of something. Well, simply being consequences for choice. Yeah. Yes. You know, that that means, uh, ooh, did I make the right decision? Mm-hmm. And, and you're empathizing just because you're like, did I make the right decision? Exactly. But, uh, yeah, I... I agree. Hmm. And one more question as we start to move a little bit closer to actually coming up with an idea for a game is, are we going to be aiming for something more like a video game or something like, say, a role-playing game or a board game? Um, 
and I guess that might depend on what it is we're trying to portray. You know, some things might be better in a video game, some things might be better in a role-playing game. Mm -hmm. Um, But, you know, for instance, if we were to come up with a video game, it could be kind of like, oh, that's a cool concept, but if we come up with a role-playing game, we might actually be able to build it, which would be kind of fun. I played a board game the other day, a fairly new one, called Whitechapel, Mm -hmm. and it's about Jack the Ripper, and it's very historically accurate. Um, And you have four nights, and over the course of the four nights, there's five murders, and one person is Jack, and Jack is actually somewhere in the city being tracked by Jack. And all the others are cops, and they're trying to go around and find him. And you can either look for clues or you can make an arrest. Mm. And it's just about moving pawns around on a numbered grid uh, that's a map of Whitechapel, which is in London. And that's it. So some people would probably find the game extremely boring. We found it incredibly exhilarating. And, and I played as Jack, and I actually got away with it. And, huh. and it was um, it was deeply suspenseful, deeply suspenseful. And we're just talking about moving pawns around on a number. Well, so why was the suspense there? Because of the the, the meta of what we thought was going on. So for mine, um, for, from where I stand, I think that a psychological thriller is a lot scarier than a horror. Yeah, I mm. agree. I mean, if you can still go back, and I and I haven't watched you know, old Hitchcock films yes that's all real psychological horror i mean mm-hmm. it's but those films are also terrifying in their own way yeah so i and i think they still hold up because, south by southwest man yeah. oh that is a that is a terrifying film and and because it's not relying on um special effect monsters you know like movies do nowadays mm-hmm. you go back and you watch a lot of these these films even if they even if they were possibly frightening in their day it looks a lot faker now. Yeah, well, sure. And and that's just going to happen. I mean, I think some movies hold up better than others, obviously, but you don't have that same problem if you're talking about a psychological horror film because mm-hmm. a lot of that is going to be in your head. Right. Will he get caught? Won't he get caught? Right. So, so yeah, so something along those lines might be interesting. And maybe maybe something something like that, you know, where it's, okay, um, you as, as the player have committed some crime and you're trying to, you know, get away with it. That concept is... Something that I would, I think, could certainly classify as a horror game, mm-hmm. and I think that's an interesting take on it too. If that's the direction we wanted to go, so it sounds like we we tend to favor, at least for the time being, more of a psychological horror approach. Yeah. Cool. So, with that in mind, um, is there any particular type of theme we want to address? Well, where does the creature from the Black Lagoon fit in? Because I just pictured he'd be in here somewhere. <laughs> no, he, he, he's, he's the only one. Jim. He's I'm one kidding. of the player characters. Um. Like, you, oh, you are the creature from the Black Lagoon, and you're trying to escape the government officials. Okay, see, this, it's basically ET. This could work actually. You, what, but what you're doing is you're you're, you're switching it around, much yeah. like I was playing as Jack. Yeah, right. and I was trying to get away with it. Mm-hmm. Um, you're you're various creatures, right? You're various. Um, horror movie characters and you, you're doing the deeds that you're doing to survive because you, that's what you do and then you have to get away with it um, you have to like frame somebody plan evidence, make them get them off your tail or leave no witnesses or... yeah, leave, that kind of thing would that, that, would that work? I mean, that's that was kind something, of a stealth game? yeah, I mean that was something that um, you could say Dexter did at least the good seasons of Dexter, yeah, the, where the first three early, yeah, the early on, I would say one, two, and four, but um, right. partic- particularly one and two, or, or in, especially one, but one and two had that element of, you know, he is trying to get away with it, and he's trying to pull one over on the cops consistently because he is killing people, and mm-hmm. there's that there's that suspense of, oh, is he going to get caught now? Oh, this person might know. Oh, how's he going to throw him off the trail? Right. So there, there's heavy suspense, and I think suspense, of course, and, and horror play into one another, and they're, they're very closely related. So maybe, maybe that's where we go. Maybe we don't need some sort of big monster. Maybe we just need it to be you know, purely psychological, psychological um, events that could actually happen. Mm-hmm. But I would hesitate to go so far as you are a serial, serial killer because I think when you do something like that, it – takes people out of it because you know not only am i not a serial killer i would never be a serial killer mm-hmm. whereas if i'm playing a game where i'm like i'm a cool space marine shooting at bad guys sure i could never do that but i kind of want to sometimes right, you know right. but i don't really want to be a serial killer and i don't and i think most people don't think in that way i'm not saying you can't play that game and there's not value there but i think 
for what we're trying to do, if we really want people to be invested in this character, we need to have put them in a situation that feels real to them. That's true. That's a good point. I have a couple of thoughts. Um, one is something that we see a lot in board games, actually, the idea of a betrayer mechanic. Yeah. Um, the Resistance has that sort of thing where you've got people who, like people among the group who are the traitors, and they know it, uh, and you're trying to figure out who it is before the game's done. Uh, but, they all, but the traitors also have an objective they're trying to achieve. Uh, Betrayal in the House of the Hill, very good example. Mm-hmm. You don't know until halfway through who the traitor is, but then once you do, um, your job is to basically win as the traitor or to stop the traitor. Right. Um, I'm sure there are many other games out there that do this. Oh, um, Dead of Winter. There's usually a traitor in there. Um, not always, but the chances are there's going to be a traitor. Um, but you don't know for sure that there will be, so it's interesting because it's possible that nobody's a traitor. Um, and so you don't want to necessarily read too much into what people are doing. And yet there's a pretty good chance that someone is, and they have a certain objective they're trying to do to like sabotage. And the Walking Dead were humans the whole time. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, oh, that'd be so great if like some sort of a, it was really just a gas leak, and they all are hallucinating, and they're just re- normal people that are just walking to them asking for help, and they're just killing them because <laughs> nice. they think they're zombies. Well, there was um, in Shyamalan Batman. twist. In, in Batman <laughs> Begins, you've got the uh, the gas they release that like makes everyone start hallucinating, and right. Then, like, Right. You know, I've got like these these zombie like people or behavior, but they're all just like really frightened at each other. And so they're it's random violence and chaos, but it's because everyone's just freaked out by everyone else around them. Mm. Um, and the other thought, and actually that kind of ties into that, is what if we have some sort of game where I don't know if everyone's on the same team or if they're not, but there's something where one of the mechanics occasionally will take control of your character for you and kind of force you to do things that maybe you don't want to do. And that loss of control here and there is something that can be kind of scary because you as the player have an objective, but you don't know at what point maybe you pull this card that says you do this, but you don't have any control over it. You need a really good narrative reason to yeah. buy that and, one. Yeah. And I would say I would almost, instead of doing that mm-hmm. in particular, what if you know you feel like you can't, you feel like you have to do something because of the situation, mm-hmm. but you're, you don't... Your, your control's not being taken away. Like, mm-hmm. for example, it's, it's a common thing in, in horror stories where um, the bad guy's nearby and you're able to find a hiding spot. Mm-hmm. And you got to stay perfectly still and try not to breathe too loudly because the bad guy might know you're there. But if you wanted to, you could just step out and go, hey, what's up? You'd die. Mm-hmm. You know, you're not really losing control, but at the same time, you really can't move. You actually are confined and you... It, if you see kind of where I'm going with mm-hmm. this. So maybe it's like a way to kind of play with that mm-hmm. and give them a situation where um, they need to do something that they, they need to basically be inactive, but mm-hmm. they don't, they're not taking that control away. Or they basically, they have to, to move away from this area because of XYZ reason, mm-hmm. but you're not forcing them to do it. Mm-hmm. Or in the case of uh, like one of the choices in Until Dawn that I mentioned where you have to pick between who you're going to kill or they both die. You yeah, give, the, give them a tough choice. Right, you have no choice, but someone's going to die, so you don't want to make that choice, but you also have no choice. Mm-hmm. But you do have a choice, you know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. So, like, someone's going to die. You are going to kill someone, mm-hmm. but your choice is who do you kill, but yeah. you don't really want to make that choice And that, that, all, that right so. there is almost kind of Saw-like, and actually Saw, in and of itself, has a lot of sort of game-like elements. You know, it's like a really right. twisted it's game, but, you know, he's basically walking people through a game that he's set up where, like, hey, so here's the deal. You can die or you can do this thing, or whatever the case is, you know, there's the different scenarios, but um, you know, maybe we can pull some ideas from that if that's kind of the direction we want to go in of like kind of the the tough choice of you can let this happen to you or to someone else, or you can take action and do this um, that you might not want to do, but maybe you feel like it's ultimately the better choice. And I kind of like the idea of of giving the players these options, especially if we're if we are going into a multiplayer game mm-hmm. setup. So if we go in that direction then you could have each character um, essentially be on the same level mm-hmm. as one another, and they could be, you know, maybe one of them through some action in the game gets captured. And now, oh, well, um, you could kill them, or you, could kill, or you can, like, you know, kill yourself, or you will die if you don't kill them, or something mm-hmm. like that. Mm-hmm. So now it's like you have the other player... Uh, begging, hey, don't kill me, man, don't kill me. <laughs> well, but I have to because I'm going to die yeah. if I don't. It's, kind, know, it's kind, kind of approaching like game theory sort of territory yeah. along the lines of like, um, uh, you know, like Prisoner's Dilemma and that mm. sort of thing where he's kind of like, okay, here's this, here's the situation, here are your options, and like there are pros and cons to each. And in the Prisoner's Dilemma, it's about trust. You know, it's like, do you trust the other person to cooperate with you? Um, 
you know, we can sort of play with themes like that, too, of, like, to what degree do you count the pl- other players around you to cooperate with you or, you know, whatever the... Yeah, that's a neat idea. A whole game around the Prisoner's Dilemma or uh, the trolley car experiment or, mm. you know, that kind of... That would be really cool. Yeah, so then, then it becomes... The fear is it's all your worry about the way other players are going to screw you. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And... Um, I mentioned at one point about uh, that game that I've played, Virtue's Last Reward, uh, Zero Escape. And that's actually, that whole story is based around the prisoner's dilemma. And again, it's one of those things where you're kidnapped by whomever and you've got a bunch of people in a room. And it's it's a escape the room sort of puzzle game. Mm. Um, but in the story, there's this thing where, like, you know, there's a point system they've set up where you have to, like, you know, either choose to trust or betray the your partner at whatever time. And um, based on what you do... Uh, you'll like you know gain points or lose points, and if you run out of points, you die. Uh, and so, like that, that's more a narrative thing. And you do get to choose as the player what you do um, when you like you walk in, you walk into separate rooms and you make your choice. Hmm. And of course, now that's kind of set up. You know, again, it, it's kind of like Saw. They set up these things. Um, now that could be like if we want to go in a direction like that where um, we have a setup that the players are sort of going through and they have to make these decisions as they go along. We like sort of write scenarios. And I am thinking kind of like board game, role playing game sort of thing. Almost like a multiplayer choose your own adventure if that's kind of the mm-hmm. direction we're going. I think in. so. And I think, I think if we take it, I know we mentioned before making it psychological and maybe moving away from maniac, but I think, I think we need a maniac in this case. If, Might, we're, yeah. if we're going for. Everyone's a player, mm-hmm. but maybe th- maybe there is no player that's a maniac. Maybe it's just like this, almost like a natural phenomenon in the world that gets pulled up via cards or, or, or a piece on the board that consistently moves or something. I don't know. Mm-hmm. Um, but the idea here being it can interact with the players, the players can interact with the maniac, but you know, you have this element of, well, the maniac might kidnap a, a player, and now you have to either... You have a choice. You can try to... Uh, you can either, you know, you're you're in a situation where you can die, or you can try to save the person, mm-hmm. or maybe you have to choose between two two different players, that mm-hmm. kind of thing. I'm not sure if maybe a game like this already exists, but I'm thinking something between Dead of Winter and uh, Pandemic, mm-hmm. where Pandemic is you're a team and you're cooperating against the board and you're trying to like cure all these right. diseases. Yeah. But what if the idea is that like it's something like Pandemic, where there's the, some crazy disease that breaks out um, and it's killing millions of people and you all are just like people on the ground um, trying to survive this thing and what happens if one of you happens to contract the disease or you suspect they contracted the Mm. disease well there's a Cthulhu uh, pandemic Mm. and I actually had a chance to play that recently and so what happens is that cultists break out instead of the disease (laughs) Uh, and and they have a tendency to show up where they've been before Hmm. Um, and you can go through and as an action you can eliminate a cultist uh, but then every now and then Shogos will show up. And what happens is that new, um, you know, greater evils will show up and whenever uh, evil progresses. And so you flip over a card and then new rules change the game as it hmm. goes along. It gets a little harder to, to do what you're trying to do. And you have to seal all four gates in the four different towns in time. So the scale is very different. It's not hmm. worldwide. It's just, it's just in, you know, kind of the Boston mm-hmm. area. Um but it, it was really good. Really enjoyed it. Um, had the right flavor of, oh, no, what's going on now? And felt like my character mattered and, and the other characters because of the, the special abilities. I played the doctor, so uh, I had five actions instead of four, so I mm-hmm. felt really powerful. But um, And see, I would think for th- that That kind of reminds me. Yeah, I would think for it. us thematically if we're – maybe this is just because of the games and movies that I've been watching recently to get in the Halloween mood. Mm-hmm. But um, I'm thinking if we do go with a – players against the board mechanic and the, and the players all have to be different in some way I, I would think it's supposed mm-hmm. to just all being the same then I I really like the idea of going with the high school type type theme oh yeah where you know you still have there's different players there's like there's um, you know the jock there's like the cheerleader there's the there's the math nerd you know like just like mm-hmm. basic stereotypes mm-hmm. but they all have their positives and negatives right. so we can put like a slight spin on the characters as opposed to just everyone is the same trying to interact in the space in the same way just so it's a little bit more fun similar to what you were talking about yeah last night on earth went and just sort of embraced that trope Mm -hmm. it was a a board game that i really enjoyed sort of underrated i think uh as a zombie game 
I am really intrigued by kind of this um, choose your own adventure idea of um, you are all caught in this situation. You've got to kind of puzzle your way out. And there's going to be situations that make you kind of compete with each other potentially or you have to make tough choices. or Because, I mean, it it would still be a cooperative game in Mm -hmm. the sense that you're trying to beat the board, but at the same time, Certain events could happen. Like let's mm. let's say it's a card, a, you know, card game, and you're pulling up, you know, these phenomena that happen, mm-hmm. and you're trying to say make your way out of this space. Like you're in this house, mm-hmm. or you're in this, um, you know, catacomb, or some sort of like space that like like a big mansion or something, like mm-hmm. the Resident Evil mansion or something. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like a space where there's a lot of rooms, a lot of places to go, and you gotta maybe you have to survive the night. That's mm-hmm. the idea. Cause that's a pretty common theme in horror films. Mm-hmm. And so, or maybe you're trapped in a high school. Or maybe you're trapped in a high school. Yeah. There we go. I like that. You got, trapped you got in a get locked school. in overnight Perfect. in a high school. And, Perfect, because yeah. it's big. It's got lots of rooms, mm-hmm. lots of places to go. And rooms also have themes, mm-hmm. which I like about a high yeah, school. They do. So you got a library. you got, like, the, the you know, the, the science lab. you got the cafeteria. you got all these different spaces that, you know, things can happen in different ways. Mm-hmm. Um, so we have that element going for it. Mm-hmm. And then we do have potentially characters in different areas of the house, possibly. Mm-hmm. Um, but interacting in certain... So, like, you know, maybe... I think I think one of the things that we are kind of dancing around is, are there going to be, I guess there would be, um, is he setting up traps in this area? Are you getting mm-hmm. caught in traps, and now you have to get your way out of it? Mm-hmm. But he try, you, you get situations where you're presented with ways out that are potentially mm-hmm. only going to benefit you. Mm-hmm. Maybe the easy way out is to just benefit you and like screw your I'm kind of imagining with, because or... I don't want it to be purely cooperative if an element of the game is going to be betrayal and making these tough choices. Right. I think the objective should always be for you to survive. And so if you get eliminated from the game, you lose. Right. Um, and sometimes it comes down to like, okay, I have to make a choice and it's either you get eliminated or I get eliminated. Right. Uh, so well, I'm, I'm going to choose I, you. It's cooperative versus. It's, right. Yeah. But, but I, then I'm thinking that a way we can sort of add a little bit of a twist would be to like sort of randomize characters' relationships to each other where like maybe you have secondary objectives like you only win if you and so-and-so survive. Right. Um, I, I do like that. And I do like the idea of there could be some sort of like an extra bonus condition of everyone survives or, Mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying? Like, because I I also like the idea of you're sort of working together as long as you think that you can Mm -hmm. handle it. But the moment you're like, Oh no, um, too bad. Mm -hmm. I have to just protect myself. Yeah. Screw you. Or maybe there's like a, Again, like kind of changing up what each person's objective is. Maybe there's one that's like the savior complex where mm. you get your objective if everyone survives, for example. Yeah. Um, but okay. someone else's objective might be like only I and this other person need to survive. Mm-hmm. Or maybe someone else's is like only I'm going to survive or whatever the case might be. And so there can be cases where like, you know, say everyone survives. This person with the savior complex wins. The person with me and so and so survives. They win. The person with only I survive. They lose because more than just they survived. Are we going to have a mechanic where two, uh, some characters hate each other? So yeah, you, I, was, like, I was thinking so. Yeah, like See, you win. Hidden, you win if you really kill this person. You win if this. I'm sorry. You win if this person dies. Mm-hmm. So if you you don't know who hates you because mm-hmm. the relationships are random, not based mm-hmm. on the character you choose, obviously. So. You're in a situation where you, you have to, like, you could potentially help them, and it's not even that hard, or mm-hmm. you can just leave them to die, and you just leave them to die, because you're like, hey, uh, the, I'm going to win the game if I do this. Later. <laughs> That's interesting. Hmm. I also played a game uh, this week that was called Antidote, hmm. and even though it's not thematically what we're talking about, it's actually very similar hmm. in that um, you're all researchers in a lab, something has broken, and you're all going to die in 30 minutes. And so you have to figure out which one the antidote is. The man, mechanically, the way you work this is there's X cards, and the Xs are always the, the bad thing. Mm. And so you put the one of them, uh, there's like about five, depends on the number of players. You can play with seven players, which is great. Uh, but you pull one of the cards aside, kind of like Clue, mm-hmm. and then based on the process of elimination, you have to figure out what's not in play. And so... One of the mechanics is discard. Everybody has to discard a card at the same time in front of them. And eventually you're left with one card in your hand, and that's what you drink. And so when you drink it, uh, if it matches and it's the right thing, you win. Uh, you don't die, in other words. If you if you have the wrong thing and you drink it, you die. And so <laughs> it's kind of like, like what we're talking about here, except with a different... Uh, different focus in a different genre. Well, what's interesting about it is that there is a uh, an add-on to the game that comes with it whenever you buy it, and it is about relationships. 
and and it's called uh, it's it's the romance edition. And so you've got a Romeo, a <laughs> Juliet, an Iago, uh, Casanova, and all these other roles. And if you are, for example, a Romeo and Juliet, and either one of you dies, then you drink the other one's poison and you die too. <laughs> and so you have to both live in order to to win that <laughs> kind of a thing. And then there's other ones who are like, um, you know, if unless you're the only one who survives. You don't win, and if you know, it's, it's that kind of thing. Right. Um, but I, I really like the idea of just shifting that, and it suddenly becoming about the uh, high school politics. Of, yeah, yeah, you know, of that kind of thing. That's cool. I like it. So take it and maybe uh, the, ma- the maniac is the lunch lady. By the way, spoilers. <laughs> oh, it's secretly always, the lunch lady. You find yeah. out at the end. Yeah, she's been she's been baking kids into the sloppy joes. <laughs> oh, uh, oh, yeah, I went there. I went there. Um, I kind of like the idea that there's some sort of supernatural element that, like, aside from having a maniac, is something that actually poses a threat in an otherwise harmless high school. Mm-hmm. Um, and another thought I just had is maybe there's some element of when you hit a certain point, uh, maybe that's like even like written for your character, like. Flip, flip one of the secret cards you have whenever this happens to you. Mm-hmm. Um, and when you do that, it's kind of like you you sort of like awaken your power, whatever your sort of like latent power is. Oh, neat. Um, and that can also be randomized. So it's not like, oh, if I'm if I'm the jock, this is always going to be my latent power. Mm-hmm. Um, and maybe the jock is always like, when this happens to you, you awaken your latent power. Well, you could work it into the narrative that whatever it is that's happening mm-hmm. is awaking Awakening powers in people, mm-hmm. that kind of a thing. Yeah. Um, well, it, it reminds me. Everything we said reminds me of Stranger Things, actually. Yeah. Hmm. As so connection there, I yeah. Think. And 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 you've got this upside down, and there's a monster, and there's all this other stuff. But um, you know, it's it's significant to me. It seems that they have come out. The the brothers have come out and said while they're working on season two, uh, their inspiration, their greatest inspiration, has been Breaking Bad. Hmm. That that's what they want to model, and I'm like, mm. what? It doesn't. That's not. It's, huh? <laughs> um, and, is, it, and, is it the character relationships? And no, way? it's the five season story arc. Oh, oh I see. Okay. So they're writing it with the intent of being five seasons. They're writing it with the the sort of rising action, falling action. Is, is flow. the last season going to be split? into two <laughs> real seasons, but they're just going to pretend like it's two halves of one season, and even though they take an entire year between each one. Don't know. I have no idea. God, that was annoying. I know, I right? love that show. I love that show, but, oh, that was frustrating. Yeah. Uh, but it's interesting to me that they acknowledge that and mm-hmm. that they say, um, listen, we're, we're, we know what we're writing. We're writing a suspense horror 80s thing. Um, we get our setting, but... No, what we're looking at as we're doing this is a completely different type of show because that has a suspense built into it as well. And it did. Is mm-hmm. he going to get caught? You know, is Walter White going to get caught? What's going to happen? Is this going to work out okay for him? Is it not going to work and out how, okay for him? And how is he going to, you know, oh, looks like, uh, you know, this character might know or this character suspects or that character suspects. And how is he going to get away? Right. How is he going to trick him or how is he going to, you know, how is he going to get back home so that he, he can avoid right. suspicion? The cartel's on to him. This this drug lord's on to yeah. him. That kind of thing. And he just, he eliminates them all one by one and ends up cleaning up, like, all the whole Southwest's drug trade. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. He's actually a great hero in, the sen- in that sense. Uh, but a, as, a, as a personal hero, he's a complete failure as a dad and everything else. Mm-hmm. And so t- I'm, I'm wondering how much of that is going to end up in Stranger Things, which I... I have not been as appropriately nervous and scared while watching a show as that. So I feel like I need to bring that in. Um, what would a game uh, that takes place in the Stranger Things world be like? Yeah, I think if we do have the what you're talking about with some sort of like awakened power thing, it needs to be obviously subdued and mm-hmm. it needs to be horror related. So yeah. things yeah. like um, like Carrie, that kind of you know. Powers or like the like eleven, like eleven and Stranger Things. Another example of these like they're they're slight you know abilities, but it's not like you're suddenly Superman or something. Yeah. You know, it needs to be very. That's not heroes, in other words. Right. It needs to be very. Sub- yeah, exactly. Not heroes. Yeah. Definitely not heroes. Save even, the cheerleaders. Save the world. And they sh- and it should probably be a, so the sort of thing where it's it's very situationally in terms of helpful. Mm-hmm. So it's like you know maybe if you if you can. You know, start fires with your mind or something. Well, that might help you in certain situations, but it's not going to do jack and mm-hmm. others. Mm-hmm. So it needs to be balanced in that way. And maybe it'll actually be horrible. Like maybe if, if the room is filling with gas, 
You probably don't want to use your powers, and yeah. you'll blow yourself and anyone else, everyone else up. I'm kind of imagining is the the scenario to kind of frame this. Um, and to a degree, there is like this does bring in the maniac, but it's more of kind of like a puppet master sort of maniac, right. not like literally following you around with a machete trying to kill you. Right, and I think um, that should vary too. I yeah. mean, that can vary based that's, on. That's a good point. You know, it could be a different. Mm-hmm. But I'm, I'm imagining that like somehow someone's watching you and they see this potential in this group of like five kids in the school, mm-hmm. and they're all in detention. And that's why this happens. And basically what ends up happening is they get locked into the detention room and then let out after the school's closed. And by then, some sort of like weird magical barrier has been erected where they can't leave school grounds. Um, so that's why they're stuck in the school. It's like the breakfast yeah, club. Yeah, I was going to say, we're, we're, <laughs> making, we're making breakfast club, I, I, too. That, that thought crossed my mind. Um, <laughs> but, um, we've, got but, the, we've got the athlete, the cheerleader, the, we've got the nerd. <laughs> Um, they're in detention. Mm-hmm. There's a maniac. This is Breakfast Club, but, yeah. but that's but that's the reason that they're all there at the start of this thing, as opposed to being like, oh, well, you all happen to stay late at school for all your various reasons or whatever. It's it's like you were you were put there by someone, and then you were trapped there, there mm-hmm. by someone, mm-hmm. and then whatever else happens. And you know, I'm kind of wondering if it's like you know, is it like the booby traps in the room, or is it more like ghosts or demons or something else starts and, appearing and, and messing see, with you? And see that where, that that I can see could be could vary based on. Mm-hmm. Like some sort of a card draw or something like that, yep, where yep. different scenarios, right? To give it a little bit of a different flavor each time. Mm-hmm. Like this, this, this game, you're up against the maniac. This mm-hmm. game, you're up against like, you know, the puppet master with all his traps or whatever in, mm-hmm. in the rooms. This game, you're up against like, you know, ghosts. Mm-hmm. School is haunted, you and know, it's always the same like same map of the school that we provide. Right. Basically, just like a, a floor plan. But each game, would, you'd be going up mm-hmm. against the different antagonists. Yeah, whether it's like physical or spiritual. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, of course, we'd have to find a way for the powers to be useful in all situations. Well, I don't think I don't think we do because I think the whole issue with um, you know those like those latent abilities is they might come into play or they might not. Mm-hmm. They have to be triggered in some way. I think yeah. it should be something where it's rare. It's like each one has a condition, mm-hmm. and if you meet that condition at any point in the game, mm-hmm. you now unlock this ability. Yeah. But the condition is pretty specific. Mm-hmm. So, I, like, I think I too would like to have a separate condition card and a separate um, ability card. Because oh, so you draw both so it's not always yeah. the same. Yeah, I agree with you. That so that sense. like someone doesn't draw the card and be like, oh, I can get this power. It's like, oh, I don't care about this power, so I'm not going to try. Or, or, um, or they play the game a lot and they know what mm-hmm. it takes. So yeah. they know, well, I don't have this card, but I know that card's out there, and I don't want that person to get that, right. anyone else but me to have mm-hmm. it, so I'm going to try to make sure that doesn't happen. Yeah. So, and yeah. we probably want the triggers to all be bad things, things you're not really going to try to get. Exactly. It's more like exactly. when your health is down to one or something like that, yeah. um, just as an example. And I'm also imagining to um, kill one of your, uh, <laughs> let or, one of your uh, team members die, mm-hmm. or um, <laughs> and maybe this is even tied into your objective. So, say you have an objective where um, you want to keep someone else alive, but if that person dies, that's your trigger, yeah, and that's the thing that gives you the power. Um, and then whatever your power is is secret until you get it, so you're not like trying to get one right. thing or another based right. on that ability. Um, well, you wouldn't even hand them out; you would just draw them from a yeah. from a deck when you unlock it. It's like you've unlocked your power because you triggered whatever the condition was, which is a hidden condition for you. Right. And oh, okay, I did. Okay, I'm gonna pull it. Pull a card out of the power deck. Mm-hmm. You know. And exactly. now, so that way you're never it's never there mm-hmm. beforehand. Right. And I'm also picturing. Um, because it's because it's a horror game, we need to make sure that we keep that suspense and we keep that terror. I think the players cannot be very powerful, right? Um, right. And I think a lot of times, like you know, I, I don't want to necessarily just do the thing where it's like, okay, you walk into this room and draw a card, and this thing happens, and like here's options A, B, and C or whatever. Although that could be a way to approach it. Um, so like the the specifics of how exactly we'd approach it, I think. Is up to discussion. We have that's that's more in depth than we have time for on this particular podcast. But I definitely think that whatever the threat is out there, um, the players it shouldn't necessarily be like you know any given card could kill me when I draw it sort of thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, definitely. But it, we do need to have this feeling of like you can't you can't be a hero. <laughs> you know, you, you're trying to survive, not overcome. If that makes sense. Yeah, I think there's a lot of lessons to be learned from like Mansions of Madness, mm-hmm. just the way that it treats heroes as being very crunchy mm-hmm. very very crunchy um, the the new 2.0 version I think does a really good job of that because even after you uh, would have died you don't actually die you just take the condition of being injured mm. and then you continue on and if you lose all your health points again then you actually do die or out of the game mm. so there's like a there's like a status a halfway status 
to, to get to death, mm. that kind of thing. And I like that. Um, talking about the Cthulhu uh, pandemic game, whenever you uh, go crazy, you have to flip your card over, mm. and then your stats change, mm. that kind of a thing, and your abilities change. So I, I like card, uh, games that do that, mm. where, where your, your character card flips over and is different. Very cool. Mm. I want to make this game now. <laughs> yeah, there, there's a lot more to discuss about it, but and I think we've only scratched the surface, but mm-hmm. I think we have had a pretty productive discussion and have a general direction of where we might go with it. Mm-hmm. Well, dear listeners, we'll let you know if we happen to actually make this thing, and then uh, when we do, where you can get it, where you can play it. Um, I'm curious, too, to like what extent it will be a board game and to what extent it might be a role-playing game, or maybe there's a little bit more flexibility as far as mm-hmm. what you describe yourself doing and how the GM sort of judges how that plays out. I think, though, for what we're going for, it's probably got to be more concrete. Like, you know, here is the mechanic, and if you make choice A, this happens. If you make choice B, this happens. It's very set in stone. Mm-hmm. Right. Sh- I don't think there should be a GM. Yeah. I think it should play Just the board itself. against the players. Yeah. Well, yeah. As, a, as a way of doing... Uh, an RPG kind of a thing. I actually am reminded of police cops and the mm. way that the characters are generated in that, which is uh, you pick a thing that you're good at, and then the character to your left is bad at that thing. Mm-hmm. And so if you say, what is your goal? Well, my goal is to uh, kiss Stacy. Uh, and, okay, well, the guy to my left hates Stacy, that kind of a thing. Mm. Um, so that, that could be an interesting way to... Mm forcibly make conflicts in, during character creation. So it sounds like the components we have um, with everything else to be decided are um, randomized relationships between characters, randomized objectives, mm-hmm. um, which will tie into the relationships, um, some sort of randomized breaking point at which you get your special powers, mm-hmm. and then the special powers themselves, which will augment whatever sort of built-in abilities all players have. Makes sense. Yeah. And then, of course, the... Uh, the, the tough choices, however it is we make this stuff happen, the tough choices and like the special sort of scenarios that say, here's what happens, how are you going to react to it? And also, will you eat the Sloppy Joes? Don't eat the Sloppy no, Joes. No, don't eat the Sloppy Joes. I think that, that's the moral. That, that's a hint for you that listeners. That is the moral of the story. Th- those of you who are listening <laughs> will know, never eat the Sloppy Joes in our game. If you haven't listened to the backward-compatible.com podcast, you'll eat the Sloppy Joes and you will die. Yeah. Okay, there we go. So, Or you might enjoy it. <laughs> That'd be even more terrifying. Yeah, it would be. It would be. <laughs> Well, thank you, everyone, for joining us for episode number 82 of uh, the BackwardCapital.com podcast, our Halloween Spooktacular 2016. I'm Chris. I'm Jim. And I'm a meat popsicle in the form of Doc. <laughs> we'll see you guys next time. We want to join your discussion, because dialogue makes everyone better. Want to hear our thoughts on a particular game or topic? Get in touch with us on Facebook, Twitter, SoundCloud, YouTube, or at our website, Backward dash compatible about com and we might feature your question on a future episode of the podcast thanks for listening until next time stay compatible ah ah ah